It's the third quarter of 2007, and I'm here on a beautiful fall day in southern Ontario with Mark Dubovoy. And Mark is a landscape and nature photographer who specializes in printing. And Mark, you've been doing printing since you were nine years old, I think you told me, just like me. <laughs> since I was nine years old, I right. started very early in life and uh, did black and white for a long time. And uh, my world is in color, so mm -hmm. I always had a big interest in color printing. So uh, I started doing color printing when I was in graduate school, when the famous unicolor process mm -hmm. had just started. Right. And um, uh, what happened was uh, I was a student in the physics department, and they had This a, is at U Berkeley? UC Berkeley, yeah. yeah. And they had a lab where they used to grow crystals. And between 2 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the morning, there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. And they had water temperature controls and the climate. How convenient. Of the, it was very convenient, so I managed to get the key to that uh, place. Uh, and I had to go in the middle of the night, obviously. Uh, I used to process in total darkness, agitating by hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I started in color. So right. it's been a long time. Now, one of the reasons that we've gotten together is as I continue talking to photographers who are using different processes, whether you want to call them uh, alternative processes or antique processes, uh, and we've done uh, dye transfer and daguerreotype and uh, you know very large format, uh, but a traditional black and white printing. Uh, but what you do is probably as specialized as any uh, I know of, and that's carbon pigment printing, or at least I should say what you did. What I did. <laughs> Yes. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into the historical aspect as well, but right. maybe uh, let's start talking about some prints because you've brought some of your prints with you. And of course, uh, we're going to put on our cotton gloves, keep the oils off the paper. So now with our gloves on, um, let's open up this first one. Okay. Which is just a totally lovely shot of Zion from the famous Photographer's Bridge. Correct, Kodachrome bridge. <laughs> yeah, right. But the, the tonalities are amazing. Now, let's talk about the carbon pigment printing process. Uh, first of all, what is this paper? Who makes this paper? Yeah, this paper is uh, called Arches Platine. And uh, as I understand, it's the same paper that uh, Michelangelo and uh, uh, Raffaello used to use for their watercolors, made, made by the same factory, the same process, and so on. Uh, as you can see, it's a beautiful paper. Oh, and, lovely um, deckled edge. It too. has a lovely deckled edge. So one of the characteristics of uh, some carbon pigment prints is that if you make them on watercolor paper, you have the additional tactile and visual mm. feel of a very fine paper. Um, you can use all kinds of other things as a substrate. You can use uh, mylar, you can use uh, just about anything. So, you know, whereas uh, photographers who are familiar with printing on cotton rag papers, for example, papers like uh, Hannah Mueller fine art rag and so forth, right. uh, which this is somewhat similar to, Yes. Um, you know, this is not a paper that you go into your local camera dealer and buy. You go to a fine art uh, store uh, somewhere, uh, some place that sells uh, brushes and paints and, and, and fine papers. What would a piece that, of paper like this that cost? Is, that is correct. Um, it, it depends, uh, uh, but uh, this kind of paper is very expensive. Uh, uh, I would assume that it would probably cost about seventy-five dollars for a sheet of for paper. For this one like sheet this, of paper. For this one sheet of paper, mm -hmm. um, the the process is uh, extremely expensive and very laborious. And, well, we'll talk about um, the laborious <laughs> part in a minute. But what is it about carbon pigment that makes it so unique? You are working from separations. Uh, there's only two photographic processes I know of. Uh, in color that uh, became fairly popular, at least for a certain period of time, that use separations. One is dye transfer, right. and the other one is uh, carbon pigment. And in a previous um, uh, edition of the video journal, uh, we had a, a lengthy look at the dye transfer process with Katine. Right. So this is the other separation process. And of course, by separation, we mean that you take your color image, say, starting with a transparency or a digital file, and you make three black and white uh, exposures. Why don't you describe uh, that a little bit? Actually, you make four CMYK. Four. Of course. Uh, 
In the old days, uh, there were people that actually made uh, separation view cameras, where you actually had three lenses and mm -hmm. three backs, and uh, they were they were contorted in very very smart ways so that you would have perfect re registration because the parallax between one lens and the other was untenable. So they used to use slightly different angles and slightly different focal lengths and. Uh, you know, some of those machines are actually quite interesting. But um, if I can interrupt, as a small digression, the original Technicolor movie process was a three-color process using a beam splitter on three separate black and white films, and then RGB recombined. But that's a digression. Right. So, <laughs> okay, so, so back to carbon actually, the, the original carbon pigment was an RGB process, mm -hmm. and the idea was that you would take your original color image and you would put it through three filters, a red, a green, and a blue, and then you would uh, make black and white uh, images through those filters and then those images would be put on top of a substrate that originally was called a tissue because it was an intermediate step and people that uh, use things as, as intermediate steps try to use very cheap stuff so they used a very cheap paper that was thin as a tissue it turns out that was a very bad idea but a lot of people did that for a long time. Uh, and, and basically what they would do is that particular uh, tissue was coated with a gelatin that was sensitized to light and had a pigment mixed in. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it would be a red, a green, and a blue pigment. Right. And then they would put the corresponding separation negative on top and basically take it out in sunlight because it, it would take... Uh, uh, a fairly strong dose of ultraviolet radiation to get the gelatin to harden in the areas where the light came through. Mm -hmm. So basically what you would end up with is something similar to a bas relief of your photograph where the areas that were very exposed, you, you had some gelatin uh, that was very hardened and it was hardened very deep, mm -hmm. whereas the areas that were exposed less, the gelatin was not hardened. Sounds very similar to dye transfer. Um, in, in some ways it is, but, but there are some, some significant sure. differences. Yeah. And in the original process, which was in, in black and white, if you think about this as the temporary substrate and you have a layer of gelatin and, and the gelatin has been sensitized and it gets hard as it gets exposed to light, if you expose it to light very strongly, meaning the shadow areas because the negative is almost clear, then it goes all the way to the bottom, right? Uh, whereas if you have a mid-tone, it's likely to go on, only halfway through, mm -hmm. right? So what happened in the original process was the next step was to rinse this uh, particular temporary substrate uh, under uh, relatively hot water, about 105 degrees Fahrenheit, and to move it around extremely quickly to get rid of all the soft gelatin. Right. But your mid-tones would literally go down the drain. <laughs> so what you had in the original process were prints that were black and white, right. no gray. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, it took a while before somebody solved that problem. Uh, and it was a guy by the name of Swan in the 1800s that solved that problem. And the way he solved it is he figured out that you had to do a second transfer. Because if you think about it, the top of the gelatin layer is completely flat. Mm -hmm. So you have these columns, if you will, if you want to call them that way, of gelatin that, that is hard right. on a flat surface at the top. So the question is, can you transfer that to a second sheet and get it to stick? And then if you wash everything off, uh, you are left with everything, including the mid-tones mm -hmm. right? and, the, and the highlights and so on. So the way that is done is you take a second uh, sheet of film, which is the final substrate, and you put a gelatin layer on it and what you want to do is harden that gelatin layer enough so that if you squeeze both layers together, the hard gelatin from the first sheet, from, from the tissue, penetrates and, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it sticks, right? And then when you rinse it under very hot water, it won't go away, it'll right. hold it. So usually that is done by a chemical process and people tried many things, formaldehyde and other compounds. There's a number of compounds that can harden gelatin just to the right consistency. So all, all of this is done by trial and error, handmade, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. very delicate. So the idea is, let's say that you have your red image and it's got the red pigment and you have it on your tissue, which is your temporary support, right? and then you have this other sheet that already has a gelatin that is somewhat hardened. 
So basically what you do is you put them both in water and you roll them, mm -hmm. and again by hand, right pressure, mm -hmm. all, et cetera, et cetera, and then you keep them in the, in the warm water until you're sure that the gelatin has stuck to the final substrate, and then you very, very carefully peel off the temporary substrate, and then you wash it really well, and then, as you would expect, you have to go through a clearing bath later and some further washes. But I'm getting tired just <laughs> listening to it. And, and that's how you get your red layer, right? right. Uh, with modern... Or the and then you modern. do it all over again for the green and the blue. Exactly, and right. it's got to be in perfect registration, <laughs> right. blah, 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 blah. So for the more modern way of doing it, which is the way I used to do it, um, there were several things that were important. One is producing a separation the old-fashioned way is a nightmare because if you think about it, a green filter is not perfect. So if you put light through a green filter, there's some red and some blue information that went through. And this is something that some dye transfer workers know very well. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a correction mask for each one of the other two colors because you had some leakage. I'm getting even more tired. But when you make the correction mask, your highlights are not going to be neutral, so you need to make highlight masks. So uh, I kid you not, <laughs> on an average good day, I would have six or seven sheets of film to make a single black and white separation. So you're talking about 14 surfaces that have to be kept yeah. clean. And in perfect registration. Free, in perfect registration and so on. It, it turns out that the carbon pigment process is so exacting that the punches, uh, the registration punches that are used for dye transfer are, are not, not precise enough. Really? Uh, a lot of those were made by a company called Condit Manufacturing and you have to go to the serious graphic arts punches and mm -hmm. registration uh, pins. Most of them are made by a company called Stoser uh, and they're a lot more expensive and, and more difficult to use but uh, that's what you need. In a more modern way of doing things, uh, what you can actually do is uh, first of all uh, in instead of having all those sheets of film to make a separation you can do it in Photoshop, thank goodness. <laughs> Another problem, if you think about it, is if you take your negative and you go to a temporary substrate, your picture is left-right correct. But when you do another transfer, you're left-right reversed. And that was a huge problem in Photoshop, the old days. Photoshop, you can flip it. In Photoshop, you can just flip it. <laughs> right. In the old days, you, you had to go through all another kinds of Another process. You maneuvers. had to go through a whole other... Yeah, right. A whole other process. Yeah. And actually, that's how the tricarbro process was invented, which a lot of people confuse with, with carbon pigment printing. The tricarbro process, what you do is you make a print on, on a standard bromide paper, and carbro is the first three letters of carbon, the first three letters of bromide, carbro. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, after you've made that print, that print is what you use to... to make your first exposure on the tissue and it's done chemically as opposed to optically. Mm -hmm. it turns out that the chemicals in a bromide paper, if you leave it in contact with a gelatin with the right sensitizer, eventually will harden it. Mm. Okay? Okay. I didn't so, know. That. So by doing that, if you think about it, you've made a print that's correct, then when you go to the temporary support, you're left, right, reversed. When you go to the final one, you're okay. Right. Uh, so the that process was popular. The problem is that that you're limiting yourself because as we all know uh, the tonality range of a negative is is huge compared to a paper and and you're basically limited by what that paper can do sure. whereas in the prints that we have here um, that is not the case it's the pure pigment process well now let, let's talk about that because the use of the word pigment has now become popular or, or understood or well known uh, in the inkjet photographic world over the last few years because we have a generation of printers that use pigment inks and shortcut pigment is basically ground up dirt you know rather than organic right. dyes and that gives us permanence so I would assume then that these carbon pigment inks uh, are similarly you know they're pigments they're ground up they're pigments they're not inks right? they're not inks it's, but it's what's the carbon part jealous. what's the carbon part the, the carbon part is is kind of an interesting historical thing also the very first uh, pigment prints that were made were used uh, w were done using carbon black they were black and white prints and right. the pigment of choice was carbon black which is extremely intense and they could get uh, 
a huge uh, gradation of grays because they could do several layers and they would do one layer for the very, very deep blacks mm -hmm. and then another layer for other things. And, and the carbon just stuck. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, a lot of these pigments probably don't have any carbon in okay. them. They may or may not, who knows. Uh, I can tell you that, that uh, a lot of the pigments that I was using, and there were several processes, uh, there were a couple of companies. One was uh, Evercolor that uh, uh, I believe was active in the 80s, early 90s. Um, and then uh, uh, there were a couple of other people. Uh, Charles Berger uh, was leading this effort to create a process with Polaroid that would make a permanent, really high quality pigment print on a commercial basis. It was a process called Ultra Stable. Oh yes, right, I remember Ultra Stable. Yeah, yeah. So, so part of the secret to those processes and to the pigments that I used was that uh, really high quality pigments were developed for the automotive industry. And uh, you could get phenomenal consistency and phenomenal quality. Uh, we were just talking at lunch about the fact that uh, uh, automotive paint is much longer lasting now because they make these pigments that can resist sunlight and UV and acid rain and mud and mm -hmm. you know whatever. Um, and uh, those were the pigments that I used. Uh, the problem is it's very difficult to get the materials. If you want to buy pigments today and you go to a company like DuPont or BASF or whatever, they'll say, Okay, our minimum is, you know, 250,000 pounds or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> How many truckloads would you yeah. want? <laughs> and, uh, and it's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and the process is, is also uh, quite daunting. It's uh, uh, probably the most difficult uh, printing process around. It's the most difficult one I ever tried. There may be one that's worth, mm -hmm. right. if there, <laughs> worse. If there is, I don't know of a process that is worse. Now, it's, you were saying... Uh, and, and I really want to dive in and look at prints in a minute. But you were saying that uh, a print like this is about a hundred hours of work? That is correct. Not all of it going like this, but, no, but many steps, time in between, spread out over what, like maybe four days? It's spread over four or five days. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, first of all, you have digital work. Right. You know, these, these things are, are extremely sensitive and all your Photoshop work has to be done very nicely and precisely and so on. And then you have to flip it and then you have to do your separations and Photoshop and all of that. Then you have to make the separation negatives. Uh, I never made them because you need a, a machine that is very expensive to do mm -hmm. that, an image setter. And it requires a lot of maintenance and so on. So, so the typical thing, at least for me, would be to go to a lithography shop and have them make the separation. Right. So obviously that takes time and... and Get in the car. And they're driver. expensive. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> or ship it or whatever. Yeah, right. And, you know, separations are expensive. And once you get the separations, uh, there's all kinds of steps. You have to prepare your emulsion. You can't go and buy the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things about Ultra Stable is that they actually had the paper already coated. Mm -hmm. but, but you have to start mixing pigments and sensitizer with the gelatin and all that stuff. You have to, you know, coat the intermediate sheets, the, the so-called tissues, which in the more modern process, mylar was the preferred material, right? Uh, you take a piece of watercolor paper, it's not ready to receive sure. the thing. You have to shrink the paper. You have to put a lot of gelatin in it. It's what's called sizing. That takes a fair amount of time. Then you have to do your exposures. Now, to do your exposures, you know, for those that started printing color with color heads, if your color was off, you just redial. Right. Here you have to make a whole new separation. Oh! Because the exposure is critical. <laughs> right. If you expose the yellow longer than you need to, your print's going to be yellow. And so if you wonder why we're wearing gloves, <laughs> each one of these is a standalone individual work of art. Uh, with a pretty much. huge amount of money and time and labor and love, you know, that went into making it. So. How many people, first of all, you, you've always talked about this in the last few minutes in the past tense. When did you stop? <laughs> I, I stopped in about 2002. About five years about ago. About five years ago. And I, I stopped for a number of reasons, uh, uh, even though I love them. And they have a look of their own. You've oh. seen them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing looks quite like it, which is true of most processes, you know. Sure. Everyone's unique. Yeah, you were talking about alternative processes. I think we're faced with a bunch of alternatives. Yeah, so exactly. every one of them is an alternative process. <laughs> this is a difficult, expensive <laughs> alternative. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you want to spend 
a hundred hours and a thousand dollars worth of materials, mm -hmm. uh, you can make one print. Sure. Or maybe a few more, maybe four. Yeah, know, I think you said together. you make you can make as many as four at a time. Uh, something like that. Yeah, that's depends pushing how it. many screw up along the yeah, way. Yeah, that's pushing it. <laughs> right. and, and there's some size limitations too, because the larger you get. Uh, the registration issues and the evenness of the coatings and so on get to be unwieldy. Uh, I believe that the largest carbon pigment print ever made was something around either 24 or 28 inches. You, you just can't go any bigger than that right. in any one And these inch. are about 1620s. These are 1620s. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously the expense and laboriousness, but the other reason is that uh, I had worked with the people at Evercolor, and I had also uh, worked with uh, uh, an individual, Todd Gangler, in Seattle that uh, was a terrific uh, carbon pigment uh, uh, printer. And uh, frankly, I haven't talked to him in a while, so I don't know if he's still doing it. Last time I talked to him, he had given up on color. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that we used to do was, before anybody committed to a... Uh, separation negative at which point you are really committed and they cost hundreds of dollars to make right uh, we would try and trade test prints and and in fact with Todd I, I almost had a contest going I would send him my interpretation of a transparency and he would say I can make that better and and he would <laughs> tweak my file in Photoshop and send it back and see and, and he said see I'm better than you are right. and you know we kept this thing going back and forth sure. and and we started at first doing it with, with iris uh, prints, mm -hmm. and then eventually... So those were your proof prints? The those iris were proofs uh, to see what the files would look like and hopefully what the image would print like. And then eventually we moved into inkjets. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, in looking at these things, I started to go, oops, the inkjets are getting darn good. Better and better. Better and better. So right around the time that the Epson 9600 came out, which is about the 2002 time frame, mm -hmm. the inkjet prints were getting good enough that uh, it, uh, it was uh, uh, really not worth it to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue was that the materials became even more scarce. Um, for a while, there were ultra-stable materials available. At that point, they were gone. There was a lab called Ataraxia in Pennsylvania that used to also make prints. They had some materials that were coated by Polaroid. That was gone, mm. and all of a sudden, you were faced with, you know, mm. do you want to spend a million dollars buying yeah, yeah. truckloads of stuff? No, and, and it's like uh, when we talked just, to Katine about dye transfer, when Kodak finally said, we're not going to make the materials anymore. Uh, he ended up spending a fortune buying up everything he could find and filling his garage with refrigerators and freezers, you know, for the materials. And now, what, 15 or 20 years later, he's still using those materials. But if someone said today, I want to learn how to do dye transfer, you can't. The materials just aren't there. Yeah. And, and you know, I think there may be a few people doing black and white. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I quit making these prints, uh, there were five people that I know of in the entire world that were still doing it. And I know that two others quit at that time, too. So mm -hmm. that left maybe two. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, let's, let's actually now see what all the fuss is about. Okay. So uh, this, is, this is a very lovely photograph from uh, Kodachrome Bridge in Zion National Park. Disregarding the photograph itself, but just looking at... You know, the tonalities, the colors, uh, the dynamic range. It's a lo it looks a lot to me like a dye transfer, except it's so much sharper. Dye transfers are fuzzy. And I think even someone like Katine would admit <laughs> that compared to, you know, other processes, dye transfers tend to be a bit fuzzy. There is a saturation to the colors that I don't know any, any inkjet print that can do this. And that, that is correct. I think the one thing that I have never seen better than a, a real multi-layer carbon pigment print is, is the uh, color saturation and the color purity. Mm. It is phenomenal, and uh, they are as sharp as a really yeah. good inkjet. Um, one of the things that we didn't mention is, you know, you can make... Uh, uh, cyan, yellow, magenta, uh, standard pigments that are as close to the complementary colors to the primaries as you can, but nothing prevents you from mixing other pigments. Mm -hmm. So if there's a particular tonality in a sky that you absolutely love, uh, 
you can mix a pigment that has that color oh, <laughs> and really? do an additional <laughs> layer. I mean, you, you can do any number of layers that you want. Right, of course. Uh, you're not just limited to four. You're not limited at all. And, and some people do stuff like that or have done stuff like that. Because what I'm seeing looking at here is there are steps in the greens. Correct. That I think in any other, certainly in any inkjet process that I know, and some of them are pretty damn good, those would disappear. It's almost as if uh, uh, someone lifted the gamut limiting veil and allowed all of the tonalities to be recorded. I, I think that is correct. I think it's both on tonalities as well as on dynamic range. And I haven't done any dynamic range measurements in a long time, but some people that used to do this from a technical point of view mm -hmm. always used to say, you know, the, the dynamic range, meaning the darkest area that still has detail, all the way to the brightest area that still has detail is 10 times as much in a carbon pigment print as compared to any other printing process, mm -hmm. quote unquote, back then. I, I don't know, but I, I think in some prints you can see it. The highlights can be very brilliant mm -hmm. and the shadows can be very dark and you have those very, very fine levels of color and tonality right. that, that you don't see in other processes. Let's, let's look at another one. Ah, uh, yes, this is the one which uh, may not go back to California. We have, oh, no. we have to have a negotiation. <laughs> it's, it's a resident of California. It has a driver's <laughs> license and everything. <laughs> and it's probably but, as expensive as some people's cars. <laughs> it probably is. But, um, no, this, this is just stunningly beautiful. I mean, it's a lovely photograph, uh, goes without saying. The way the, the, the tones and the colors merge from the turquoises into the blues, into the cyans, uh, just, just lovely. Now... I think the thing that jumps out at me is that what you get with this process is a paper that looks very similar, feels very similar to a very high quality rag, cotton rag paper that uh, we might use for inkjet printing, something like a Hanamula, you know, 300 weight right. uh, or 350 weight paper. Right. And yet you're getting tonalities and saturation and dynamic range that looks like it was done on a, a, on a semi-gloss print. Uh, and, you know, the, that, that to me is the difference. This just, this sings. Yeah, they, they tend to do that. Also, you know, you mentioned like a 300 paper. This, this is probably twice the, oh, is it? the thickness. Yeah. If you really uh, you know feel what? Like... I'm, I'm holding it with gloves yeah, so I can't really it's, tell. But... It's quite heavy, very heavy. And paper. to me, this is a conversation that, that we have a lot and I've talked about on camera and I talk about in, in workshops and that. To me, I, I like to print on these cotton, heavy cotton rag fine art papers because once they're behind glass, it doesn't make a lot of difference. And our mutual friend Bill Atkinson, uh, you know, has said that he prints on these luster semi-gloss type papers because once it's framed in behind glass, you get a better image on those papers, better dynamic range, deeper blacks, and so forth. But my feeling is when someone is buying an expensive print, the print itself becomes an objet d'art. There is a tactile pleasure. You know, until you hand it to the framer and then he puts it behind glass and you don't see the difference. But if you're going to be buying a print in a gallery environment, then I think there's something about well, you these see, papers. Well, you see the difference under glass for two reasons. One is it has the watermark of the platinum mm. paper. Mm. But the other one, this is very important, you have the deckled edge. Beautiful deckled edge. And you can float it like a yeah. watercolor. So if you frame it appropriately, that's appropriate, how I'm, that's how I'm going to frame different. this one. OK. There's, there's <laughs> another thing we, we haven't mentioned. Right. One more thing we haven't mentioned. If you look at the way that, that I did this, you can see that there's a little bit of gelatin on the paper because it's a tiny bit more glossy. Yeah than just a regular mm -hmm. um, uh, fine watercolor paper. And then when you get to the edge of the print, mm -hmm. there's more gelatin there. Yep. And, and if you look closely, it's you, very subtle. You can see yeah. it. It's, it's very, very subtle, subtle, but you can see it. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can vary the thickness of the gelatin layer where the print goes, and you can either preserve some of the texture or a lot of the texture yeah. or none of the texture of the paper. You know, it's entirely mm -hmm. up to you. You can also put another gelatin layer on top of the print, which I always did for protection, mm -hmm. which takes us to archival quality. Right. There are Rembrandt paintings that are 500 years old and, uh, you know, you clean them up and they look great. They look uh, 
yeah. fine. Uh, that should be the case with this. We know that the paper will last many hundreds of years. Uh, we have examples that are 500 years old right. of this same paper. Uh, and all this is is pigment and gelatin instead of pigment and oil, which is what they made those paintings with. Right. And in fact, it's better pigments. Uh, the pigments that they had back then uh, were not as good as the ones that we have right. today. Much purer today. Much, much purer and, and more resistant to mm -hmm. pollution and UV and whatever. So how long will a print like this last? A long time. Much, much longer than any inkjet. So from the uh, collector's point of view, uh, like contemporary inkjet prints done on rag papers with um, pigment inks. We're talking, uh, certainly for those, we know from Wilhelm's results, they're 125 to 200 years, uh, and this is obviously going to be even north of that. Much longer. Um, I know that Wilhelm made some tests that took it to about 500 years, and then he stopped. So, because he said the last longer than 500, but right. you, you know, who knows? Yeah, greater but, than symbol. <laughs> but but the, there's, there's no reason to assume that these are not going to last a very, very long time. Right. Well, and what's wonderful, uh, just as, as a digression, what's wonderful is that something like this can be properly framed, hung on a wall, and you know that whether you regard it as a work of art or just something that you the want to hand down to your kids and so forth as an heirloom um, and it's something that doesn't need to be in a darkened room the way you know you go to the Louvre for example and you uh, look at some of the pastels where you walk into the room in which they're on display and it takes you half an hour till your eyes can adjust to the darkness because they keep the light so dim because the right. uh, they're so fugitive uh, this can be hung on a wall in a brightly lit modern home and it can sit there for a few hundred years and it's not going to look any different than it does today. No, no problem. The, the first carbon pigment print that I saw, uh, the process was invented in the mid-1800s. And the first print that I saw was a print from the 1890s. I didn't know what it was. I walked into a gallery in Denver and they just happened to have a relatively small print. Uh, it was uh, done back in the days of RGB. It was done in the 1890s. And, and I walked in there, and I looked at this thing, and it just grabbed me, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it looked perfect, and it was about 100 years old. Mm. Uh, then I saw a print in the Getty Museum that was older than that, uh, dating back to the late 1850s. So that was a print that was almost 150 years old, and it looked like it was printed yesterday. Amazing. Two more. Now, what was this shot on? This was shot with an 8 by 10 inch camera on... Uh, you are a glutton for punishment. I am. <laughs> <laughs> you make things as hard as you can, both in Not, the field and in the darkroom. <laughs> Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> I'm learning. Right. And as I told you, selling my 8 by 10 crushed my heart. And I must confess, I still have an 8 by 10 enlarger <laughs> sitting at home. A very nice one, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is a lovely photograph. Let's move it over here. Ah, Bryce. Again, the, the level of saturation and depth and differentiation to the color. I mean, what's interesting here is, you know, we've all been to Bryce, we've all photographed there, we've all made prints. But what I think is really capturing my attention is that the subtlety of the color variations in the rock. You know, those, those oranges to yellows is amazing. And also here in the sky, how you go from these deep purples through the mauves and into the magentas. And uh, right. that's, that's something that I don't know of any inkjet printer or any, any print process. Let's forget inkjet, any color photographic process that can reproduce colors like that. And yet, Incredible neutrality here, and good, great dynamic range. I mean, from you know shadow detail right through these super brightly lit um, sunrise colors. Just great, lovely. Now, thank you. Ink jets. So that was then. That was then, and this is now. <laughs> this is now. <laughs> okay. So now the prints we're going to look at here were printed with what? Well, 
again, like you, I tend to really like the tactile feel of a pure cotton rag paper. Um, and because I've been used to thinking a lot about long-term term conservation, I try to avoid optical brighteners. I may change my mind one of these days, I don't know. I, I have printed both on the matte papers and the newer generations of glossy papers. And we have some prints here that are printed on a paper very similar to uh, Hannah Mule Photo Rag, which is called Hannah Mule Royal Renaissance. And uh, then I have some printed on Crane Silver Rag and some that are printed on Hannah Mule uh, Photo Rag Pearl. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that choice is the obvious, is what you just said. I'm trying to get all the dynamic range, right. all the D-Max and so on, and still get the tactile feel of a rag and paper. And the, the new generation of Beretta papers that is just coming out now, both from Harman and from uh, Hannah Mueller, and for all we know, everybody and their dog, you know, within the next six to nine months. Uh, those, as I was showing you at the gallery this morning, uh, those sh seem to have a lot of promise. Yes. Yeah, yes. so that's very exciting. But this is today's materials, so uh, this is lovely. But again, beautiful tonalities, lovely print, hard to fault and a great image, but doesn't have that oomph that jumps it, off it, the page. It doesn't. No, no. It doesn't. Now this one's getting, getting close. It's getting close. It has, I would love to see a carbon pigment of this. That would be very instructive. I took this image after I stopped making carbon <laughs> pigment prints. <laughs> See, because, what, and I'm just totally speculating here, but my guess is there are color gradations in here that the carbon pigment would show you that th this doesn't. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. I think we're vertical now. Looks like Canada to me. Looks like Canada. I think you said Lake Louise. Lake Louise, yeah, yes. Right, uh, beautiful photograph. And I, you've done a very good job of holding shadow detail, but I think the carbon pigment would have done better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think really we do. have a convert. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm blown away. Uh, other than a few times in uh, galleries as I've traveled, I remember I was in um, New Orleans maybe 10 years ago, and uh, someone had an exhibit of some carbon pigment prints that just knocked me out. And uh, then I started to do a little reading and I saw what was involved and I went, man, <laughs> I'm just not that, <laughs> that crazy. <laughs> so I think you have to be a little crazy to uh, pursue some of these. You have to be. Yeah, that's lovely. Now, this is another aspect of your work uh, because, of course, in addition to doing landscape work, you, you do some wildlife and nature. And this is from, uh, obviously, shot in Africa. Where, the, where and when was this? This was shot in uh, South Africa, mm -hmm. in uh, one of the private game preserves near the Kruger Park. And uh, what I was trying to do with some of my photographs of Africa is try and, and combine the, the sharpness that you can get out of a digital camera and a digital print with some of the softness of the mm. area surrounding some of the animals. In focus, out of focus. In focus, yeah. out of focus. Uh, show the environment so that mm -hmm. it doesn't look like, you know, a, a headshot that you can do at a zoo, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> this, this is a beautiful, what I would call an environmental portrait. Correct. Yeah, no, it's very, very beautiful. 1DS Mark II, I think you said. 1DS Mark II. Yeah. Yes. Very nice. With the 400DO lens. Right. Yes. Which some people say is not sharp. Look yeah, at that. I know. <laughs> you know what? I, just as a digression, because I know people are interested, I tested the 400DO when it first came out, and I have subsequently gotten another one. I didn't buy that first one because I had a right. 500F4, uh, but I was finding the 500F4 was too big to take on safari. I took it a couple of times, and mm -hmm. just maybe I'm getting older, <laughs> but I just didn't want to carry that weight. And my new 400DO, uh, which I'll be taking to Botswana on that trip that we're doing uh, right. next year, 400DO is such a sharp, terrific lens. So, it's a terrific yeah, lens. I, I think they may have even improved them since they first came out. Uh, but there, there, there's nothing to argue. And a lot of people say, yeah, but the out-of-focus areas can sometimes be a little funky. I don't think so. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> <laughs>
So much for that and, internet wisdom. And here's <laughs> exhibit B. That is very strong image. But it tells a story. It tells a story. I mean, technically brilliant, but it tells the story of the kill and what it feels like to be full. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. This, what kind of paper is this? This is uh, photo rag pearl. Oh, photo rag pearl, right. You know what? I have to say. I like um, it. I, you know, I do, but I now know I'm looking at it. I used it for a little while and then I stopped. I don't like the sheen. You know what? I like a paper that no matter how you turn it and look at it or if it's hanging, no matter which way, if you're using den glass or if you're using one of the new acrylics, non-reflective right. acrylics, I just don't like catching the glare. It reminds me of the paper. And what I like about those rag matte papers, even though they have reduced dynamic range, what I like about them is the paper disappears and you're seeing the image and you're not dealing with reflections, you're not dealing with paper surface, uh, but yet when you are dealing with paper surface and you're handling the prints, that's, that's the trade-off. Yeah, it's, right? all, it's all it's of those all factors. That trade -off. Yeah. And there's no right or wrong, No, just a matter of taste. No. It's a matter of taste and actually I find that some prints uh, are more adequately printed on one yeah. paper versus the yeah, other, right? Exactly. Uh, you want to have so. you want to have a couple of different papers in your uh, ammunition chest, correct? You no, know, to handle different different subject matter, and I think size plays a role too. Right. Smaller prints, I find, don't mind being on luster or semi gloss, or God forbid, even glossy. <laughs> but I think large prints, t to me, look better when they're matte. But again, these are all subjective. Mark, this has been terrific. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your experience on this uh, alternative process. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you. it. Appreciate it.